7. The position of women. Spiritually, woman raised the position of man. Now, elsewhere, we have this word man. We have he and him and stuff. We're talking gender neutral letter first, everybody. In this case, we're making clear that we're talking about both groups here. This is another subject on which great misunderstanding prevails. The belief that, according to al Quran, woman has no soul is almost in general in the West. Now, does Islam even... S does Islam say animals don't have a soul? Does Islam even say that the... It almost explicitly, although people could say a little bit different, but the whole unit... Uh, the, the very material world itself is going to testify, so you could say there's even the world soul. Um, so to say women don't have a soul in Islam, it doesn't make any sense. Probably hit the cold on the mind of a Europe at a time when the Europeans had no access to Alk Quran. You know, in the centuries where there was no translation in any European language. No other religious book and no other reformer has done one tenth of the Holy Quran or the Holy Prophet Muhammad has done to raise the position of women. Read out Quran, and you will find good and righteous women being given the same position as the good and righteous men. Both sexes are spoken of in the same terms. The highest favor which God has bestowed upon man is the gift of divine revelation. And we find women to whom divine revelation came, speaking spoken of along with men. And we revealed to Moses his mother, saying, Give him suck, and when thou fearest for him, cast him to the river, and fear not, nor grieve, for we shall bring him back to thee, and make him one of the apostles. 28.7 And we revealed to thy mother what was revealed. 20.38 And when the angel said, O Mary, Allah has chosen thee, and purified thee, and chosen thee above the women of the world. 341. Further, when the Holy Prophet speaks of the great prophets of God, saying, I mentioned Abraham in the book, 1941, and mentioned Moses in the book, 1951, and so on, it speaks of a woman in exactly the same terms, and mentioned Mary in the book, 1916. No other religious book has given such a high spiritual position to women. The Quran makes no difference between man and woman in the bestowal of a reward. For the good he or she does. I will not waste the work of a worker among you, whether male or female, the one of you being from the other. 394. And whoever does good things, whether male or female, and he is a believer, these shall enter the garden, and they shall not be dealt with a jot unjustly. 424. Whoever does good, whether male or female, and he is a believer, we will certainly make him live a happy life. And we will certainly give them their reward for the best of what they did, 19, uh, 1697. And whoever does good, whether male or female, and he is a believer, he shall enter the garden in which they shall be given sustenance without measure. 4840. Almost 3335. Speaking of good women alongside with good men, enumerates every good quality as being possessed by women exactly as it is possessed by men and ends with the words, Allah has prepared for them forgiveness and a mighty reward. With God, therefore, according to the Quran, there is no difference between men and women, and morally and spiritually, they can rise to the same eminence. Woman is the equal of man and rights of property. On the material side, too, we find no difference except what nature requires for its own ends. A woman can earn, inherit, and own property and dispose of it, just as a man can. And the Holy Quran is explicit on all these points. Men shall have the benefit of what they earn, and women shall have the benefit of what they earn. 4.32 Men shall have a portion of what the parents and the near relatives leave, and women shall have a portion of what the parents and the near relatives leave. 4.7 But if they, the women of themselves, be pleased to give up to you a portion of dowry, 
and use it with enjoyment and with wholesome result for four. Woman in Arabia had no rights of property. Nay, she herself was part of an inheritance and was taken possession of along with other property. She had no right to the property of her deceased husband or father. You know, kind of like in America, a, a woman has no right to inherit in American law. Now, there, there can be default judgments, but it's not a, a right, um, per se. They can be written out of the will. The Alcoran took her from this low position and raised her to a position of perfect freedom as regards to her property rights and her right to inherit, a position which, among other nations, is only partly attained, and that after centuries of hard struggle. And also, um, the husband can take a portion, uh, rather rather than it being remitted as charity, if a woman uh, even provides for her own needs, uh, not only provides for her own needs, but those of her husband and children through her salary. Um, in the West, that could be considered a requirement of her, even under the law. Um, but a man, uh, but a, but under Islam, those are considered to be charity. So, some other stuff that you would possibly reference would indicate that that thing that you reference is an advantage if you're looking at that. Polygamy. It is, however, asserted that polygamy and the exclusion of women, as enjoined in the Holy Quran, have done more harm to women than the benefit conferred on her by bestowal of property rights. The fact is that a great misunderstanding exists on these two points. Monogamy is the rule in Islam, and polygamy only an exception that is allowed subject to certain conditions. The following two verses are the only authority for the sanction of polygamy, and let us see how far they carry us. And if you fear that you cannot act equitably towards orphans, marry such women as seem good to you, two and three and four, but if you fear that you will not do justice between them, then marry only one are what your right hands possess. This is more proper that you may not deviate from the right course. 4-3. And you can see sort of implication that, well, for free or marry somebody who's not so free, but um, there's still the consent. It's not the inheriting or... I mean, there's there's safeguards to the consent in marriage that I don't think we're going over here, but like a, like somebody testifying on her behalf, that it's her consent and in her interest. Other than the typical things of the witnesses for the marriage, the woman has somebody on her side. Let's talk to her away from the, from the man and his family and whoever might be coercing her towards marriage. And they ask the a decision about women say, Allah makes known to you his decision concerning them, and that which is recited to you in the book concerning orphans of the women to whom you do not give what is appointed for them, while you are disinclined to marry them. 427. Now, the first of these verses allows polygamy on the express condition that you cannot act equitably towards orphans, and what is meant is clear by the second verse, which contains a clear reference to the first verse in the words, that which is recited to you in the book, concerning orphans of women. The Arabs were guilty of a double injustice to widows. They did not give them and their children a share in the inheritance of their husbands, nor were they inclined to marry widows who had children because of the responsibility for the maintenance of the children would in that case devolve upon them. The Quran remedied both these evils and gave a share of inheritance to the widow with a share also for the orphans. And if it commanded the taking of such widows in marriage and allowed polygamy expressly for the purpose, it should therefore be clearly understood that monogamy is the rule in Islam and polygamy is allowed only as a remedial measure. And as much as people try to pretend otherwise, um, women outnumber men, so... And polygamy allows women a bit more of a choice of the quality of husband, whether material or other terms that they can choose. And that 
not for the sake of the man, but for the sake of the widow and her children. This permission was given at a time when wars, which were forced upon the Mus al Muslimin, had decimated the men, so that many widows and orphans were left for whom it was necessary to provide. A provision was made in the form of polygamy, so that the widow should find a home and protector, and the orphans should have paternal care and affection. Europe today has its problem of the excess of women, and let it consider if it can solve that problem otherwise than by sanctioning a limited polygamy. Perhaps the only other way is prostitution, which prevails widely in all European countries, and where the law of the country does not recognize it, it is recognized in practice. Anybody who's gone to a public uh, high school, if not a public middle school, has, uh, I mean, actually, you know, attended as a student, um, knows very well these things. Um, nature will have in its course, and allowing illicit intercourse is the only other alternative to limited polygamy, and it gets worse in college. Um, seclusion, as regards to the seclusion of women, Al-Quran never prohibited women from going out of their home houses for their needs. And in the time of the Prophet, women went regularly to the Masajid and said their prayers along with the men, standing in a separate row. They also joined with their husbands in the labor of the field. They even went with the army to the field of battle and looked after the wounded, removing them from the field if necessary, and helped fighting men. In many other ways, they would even fight the enemy in an emergency. No occupation was prohibited to them and they could do any work they chose. The only restrictions on their liberty are contained in the following verses. Say to the believing men that they lower their gaze and guard their chastity. That is pure for them. Allah is aware of what they do. Say to the leading women that they lower their gaze and guard their chastity, and do not display their ornaments except what appears thereof, and let them wear their head coverings over their bosoms. 24, 30, 31. Now we see from that verse, we see the reference to the, um, the sexual purity. It's not that they're celibates or, you know, but they protect their, the private parts, basically. No one, no one sees it, um, you know, except their spouse and whatnot. The, um, and they certainly don't have sex with anyone they're not married to. Or allow the way leading to it, because it's not just not doing this, but protecting that this isn't done. Um, now, the real restriction contained in these verses is that both men and women should, when they meet each other, cast down their looks. But there is an additional restriction in the case of women, that they should not display their ornaments, with the exception of what appears thereof. The exception has been explained as meaning what is customary and natural to uncover, that women went to the Mosques with their faces uncovered is recognized on all hands. And there's also a saying of the Holy Prophet that when a woman reaches the age of puberty, she should cover her body except the face and the hands. And, you know, she can leave her feet uncovered too. But um, women tend to have that covered just to be sure that further up doesn't get uncovered. The majority of the commentators are of the opinion that the exception relates to the face and the hands. Hence, while a display of beauty is forbidden, the restriction does not interfere with the necessary activities of woman. She can do any work that she likes to earn her livelihood. For the Holy Quran says plainly, as already quoted, that women shall have the benefit of what they earn. A limited seclusion and a limited polygamy do not, therefore, interfere with the necessary activities of women, and that they are both meant for her protection and are preventives against loose sexual relations, which ultimately undermine society and undermine their safety. Um, women in my country, the average woman has venereal disease three years uh, earlier in life than men. And that alone indicates some things. And the emotional effect of, you know, men not wanting to settle down with women, that's, uh, well, other women are available. I've have my fun with this one, and um, and the and the women, you know, the the, the women, they, they want to have things perfect, uh, not not necessarily perfect, but you know, there's issues that arise from their choices too. So, um, 
and then there ends up being some war of the sex because uh, the sexes because everybody wants more right rather than focusing on what's the best thing for them to do for each other and of course let's let's also remember that in Islam a woman is allowed to leave for her needs and if something needs to be done for survival you know there's some things that are lifted on that account but for survival not because you know you know if you're literally going to starve to death or something that's that's different than oh i like to dress this way i like to eat this way i you know um we got to be very careful of justifying things um that wouldn't be okay otherwise